Hello, my name is Kelly Conroy. I'm the director of Pinnacle Healthcare Consulting, specializing in value-based care strategies. I would like to personally welcome you to Pinnacle's session titled, Value-Based Care Models and Managing Risk. Dream it, size it, and operationalize it. Providers who have invested heavily in value-based care have been better able to weather the pandemic and the economic downturn by having consistent source of revenue despite low utilization. The rapid changes in healthcare driven by the pandemic only further emphasized the need for providers to lean into value-based care. While value-based care is always innovating, 2021 presents a unique set of circumstances that point to a surge in innovation and disruption in both payment and care delivery models. Value-based care had been a priority for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, under the Trump administration but there's no reason to expect a change of course away from value-based care. In fact, the Biden administration healthcare goals will likely require an increased emphasis on cost savings and health inequities, which may result in an even greater push towards value-based care. Appointing Elizabeth Fowler to lead Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, further signals that CMS momentum on value-based care will continue. Our keynote speaker, Anish Chopra, former Chief Technology Officer of the United States, explained this morning, we will begin to see an age of open data come to fruition with the physicians as the fiduciary of data at point of care. Check out his keynote session as he explains how the High Tech Act, price transparency, interoperability, and point of care data through Blue Button and other Smart on Fire apps will play, this, uh, play out in this year. This session is titled Physician and Health Information Fiduciaries Rewarding a Better Patient Navigation in an Open Data Era. This is also available for you to put in your virtual tote bag. So that brings me to a few housekeeping items before we get started. Although I'm sad not to be with you in person, I'm glad you joined us for this exciting event. Our one unique item out of doing virtual conferences has been that these are sometimes pre-recorded as as ours is today. So this means our expert panel is in the session that you are listening to now and will be able to take your questions through the chat feature. So if you hear anything you would like to know more about, please type in your questions throughout the whole session in the tap, it, I'm sorry, the chat feature. Um, also, each attendee has access to a personal tote bag located in the navigation bar in which you can save documents, exhibitor, exhibitor materials, and sessions, etc. The tote bag also contains personal conference itinerary and um, att for attendees and so that you can flag the sessions and put them on your Outlook calendar. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Medicus Firm and, the, and Milliman, who helped uh, Pinnacle put on this, make this symposium um, possible. So please go ahead and visit their interactive exhibit booth where you can have a live chat with reps, ask questions, and even set up an appointment if you'd like to talk later. So without further ado, allow me to introduce the expert panel. Dr. Thomas Davis is principal of Tom Davis Consulting and has been promoting provider success and value-based care since the inception of the Medicare Advantage program in 1995. Brent Jensen is a consulting actuary for Milliman working from Salt Lake City. Among other experience, he has developed expertise working with providers and ACOs on risk-based contracts across the various healthcare markets. And Colleen Norris is a consulting actuary with Milliman based in Denver. She is focused on supporting providers taking on financial risk in 2015. Now let's hear from Dr. Davis. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention today. What, whether you're an operator, a provider, or a consultant, chances are that most of the folks that you associate with in the value-based care space have one thing in common. They're failures. They underperform in their payment arrangements, some to such an extent that they leave their organizations vulnerable. Um, and there are many types of underperformance, but they all stem from one underlying cause, and, and that is a lack of understanding. Uh, they, people don't understand uh, the underpinnings of the value-based care contracts, uh, the reasons behind the design, or why they work the way they do. So if you take just a few moments to understand how and why these arrangements came about, then the best practices become very obvious, and the risk of underperformance becomes very low indeed. 
Today, we're going to provide you with the competitive edge that understanding can provide. We're going to start with the general, and then we're going to move to the specific. Now, any journey of understanding starts with a good story, and our story begins in 1965. That's when uh, the federal government promised to cover essentially unlimited uh, uh, amount of health care costs for a large and growing population through the Medicare program. And it did so by paying providers uh, their usual and customary fees. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what happened next. The real cost of the program blew through all the previous estimates. And the government recognized the unsustainability of the model, and they started looking around for uh, new payment uh, schemes where they could still fulfill their promises, but do so at a sustainable cost. After a lot of research, they came up with the resource-based relative value scale, which used uh, RVUs to uh, assign value to every service that Medicare uh, decided to cover. Now, the model was really carefully researched and, and, uh, and calculated, but what really happened is that a whole bunch of folks got into a whole bunch of smoke-filled rooms and, and arbitrarily assigned value to every service that Medicare provided and then retroactively justified it using academic research. Now that's all well and good, but you all know in the real world that uh, something is worth only what something is worth. And when an outside party tries to set an arbitrary price for a good or service, the supply of that good or service changes. And that's what happened here. The healthcare stakeholders who perform procedures had more money and influence in the process than the providers who relied on more cognitive services. So the doers captured the process. And that set up a runaway loop by preferentially rewarding doing at the expense of thinking. More doctors wanted to become doers and fewer trained in primary care. And because of all this, the growth of the rate of the cost of the Medicare Advantage, of Medicare Advantage program increased even more quickly than it did under reasonable and customary pricing. Now, to the government's credit, they didn't double down on failure. They realized that any arbitrary measure of value could be gained. So they started looking around to see what other folks who had promised to cover the cost of health care were doing to control their health care costs. And you have to remember, this was in the 1990s at the height of the HMO craze. And at that point in time, the commercial payers were showing promise in being able to bend the cost curve for their commercial clients. So the government went to these payers and they asked, you know, what will it take for you to assume the financial responsibility for the promises that were made under the Medicare program? The payers looked around and they saw the potential of the Medicare population, which was huge, but they also saw the risk because the uh, uh, risk of healthcare costs in the population was equally large. So they went back to the government and said, okay, we'll accept the financial responsibility for your promises, but we'll need some statutory relief so that we can design programs which will mitigate our risk. We need to be able to create programs where the beneficiary comes to us instead of being randomly assigned. That way, those beneficiaries will be motivated to engage. We need to be able to create payment structures so that we have agents at the point of care who have a financial interest in the consequences of the cost of their care decisions. And we need to be able to give those providers gatekeeping authority so that they have control over the amount and direction of their care decisions. We also need to be able to offer broader benefits than traditional Medicare so folks will have a motivation to enroll. Well, the government took that deal. They granted the relief requested, and in 1995, the Medicare Advantage program was born. It works like this. The government pays the payer, which is uh, known as a Medicare Advantage Organization, or MAO, uh, a specific premium every month to cover the care costs of each individual beneficiary who enrolls in that payer's Medicare Advantage program. That premium is specific to that beneficiary and uh, at first was adjusted based on demographic factors like age and gender. In return, the Medicare Advantage organization assumes the financial responsibility for the cost of that beneficiary's care. The MAO attracts beneficiaries to its programs using a, a broader set of or specifically tailored benefits that the beneficiary couldn't otherwise get under traditional Medicare. And the MAO delivers those benefits by contracting with the beneficiary's selected PCP in such a way so that the clinician can feel the financial impact of their care decision. They do this by compensating the physician in terms of the aggregate net financial performance of the patients who have selected that clinician as their PCP. If those patients' aggregate 
uh, covered costs are less than the aggregate of the premiums paid by the government, then the PCP books that a pre-negotiated portion of that savings uh, as, uh, as revenue. But if those aggregate costs are greater, then the PCP is financially responsible for the deficit, usually protecting themselves against catastrophic loss through the purchase of reinsurance. In most circumstances, the beneficiary who signs up for a program has selected that particular clinician as a PCP and has intentionally granted that clinician gatekeeping powers over their care in exchange for the uh, broader benefit package that they're being offered. That way, the PCP has the tools that are needed to control costs. Now, if you've been listening, you immediately see the flaw in this uh, early form of Medicare Advantage. Since there was no premium adjustment for the potential financial risk of any given beneficiary, it made sense to preferentially recruit the healthiest seniors because they were going to be associated with the lowest costs. And at first, that's exactly what the early Medicare Advantage organizations did. Medicare caught on to that pretty quick, and they started adjusting the premium payments based on the disease burden reported by the Medicare Advantage organizations themselves. And while that certainly encouraged the MAOs to broaden their marketing, it also set them up at moral hazard and has created a data fraud problem that we have to this day. The first 15 years of the program, though, it became very clear that this model actually, uh, actually held down the rate of growth and the cost of Medicare benefits. But even so, the model was still not widely accepted. In fact, it was actively despised. By the end of the 1990s, HMOs became discredited because of their intrusiveness and lack of cost control success in lower cost populations. The Medicare Advantage was also perceived as privatizing a government program, so there were significant political headwinds. People forgot that fully half the cost of the Accountable Care Act was funded by cuts to the Medicare Advantage program, and those of us who lived through that time can attest to the significant decline in revenues that we saw under the program back then. The government came to believe that the failure of providers to embrace the program came from the idea that moving from taking no financial risk for the cost of care decisions to taking full or even partial financial risk was just too heavy a lift for most clinicians. So in 2009, they created a series of intermediate steps to smooth that journey to value. The vehicle for these steps, ACOs, were basically arrangements where clinicians could enjoy some of the upside in their efforts to control the cost of care while not being on the hook for any of the downside. But their implementation was rocky, and at first they were overly complex, and their terms changed frequently. So by the end of the Obama administration, CMS was really no closer to encouraging large number of providers to embrace financial risk through the medical advantage system than it was eight years earlier. What it did change though, what did change though was the political headwinds. Sometime during 2014, if you were looking, uh, you'd see political insiders jumping on board of a number of newly created Medicare Advantage organizations. And at about the same time in the official uh, publications, Medicare Advantage went from being a back page alternative program to front and center as the preferred and endorsed path for beneficiaries to get their Medicare benefits. And yet, still providers weren't jumping on. The previous administration figured that it was the MAOs themselves that were the barrier. Uh, they believed that these payers, payers were cherry picking markets and not contracting with providers, uh, just like the original contract, of the uh, original idea of the contract envisioned. So they decided to circumvent the M MAOs and uh, allow providers to engage in contractual risk relationships directly with CMS in the form of direct contracting entities. There was some scant interest in this program and about 50 or so organizations were approved to go live in 2021 when, as we all know, the world shut down. Everybody stayed home and nobody went to the doctor. Those clinicians who made their money based on volume through a fee-for-service payment model found themselves uh, with dramatic uh, declines in their revenue, while the physicians who made their money based on value saw their net revenues go up as their expenses dropped and because nobody incurred any healthcare costs because nobody was going to the doctor. The fee-for-service doctors that were uh, left laying on the couch saw the MA doctors driving new cars and they figured that value-based care was the place to be. That's how the current rush began and that's where we are right now. Now, we all know that CMS recently paused the last of the DC arrangements. But now, because you know the story behind how they were created and why, 
you know that value-based care is here to stay. It's here to stay because Medicare's underlying goal of shifting financial responsibility off the federal government and controlling costs using an incentivized agent at the point of care have not changed. Value-based care is here today because it's the only model that consistently bends the cost curve. It's here to stay because it works. Organizations underperform because they treat value-based care as an extension of the fee-for-service payment model rather than something completely different, which you now know it to be. In truth, a good yardstick is to use, uh, to use in system design is that if something adds value under the fee-for-service system, it subtracts value under value-based care. And there are a number of great examples of this. The electronic health record, care management, but perhaps the best is actuarial services. No, no one needs an actuary in a fee-for-service system. Uh, your goal there is to get the patient in and move them through your system. But under value-based care systems, actuaries are essential in helping you identify the opportunities to increase your payments and control your costs. And that's where we're going to examine next. Colleen and Brent and their colleagues have been working in the value-based care space for years. And you know, all the information, all the concepts that we just discussed were important, but it's only in, if you can operationalize it that you can use it to ensure your success. Colleen? Thank you, Dr. Davis. All right, so like Dr. Davis said, if you're at all familiar with actuaries, you probably know us as um, number nerds, and you would be correct. <laughs> so for ACOs and value-based arrangements, they're at their core focus on providers providing better care and more efficient care for patients. But getting the financials just right so that providers are properly rewarded for doing the right thing is no small task. So what we're going to walk through today are four major areas that are foundational to risk-based contracting and focus on the things you or your organization will need to be aware of as you contract to take on risk. Um, the first of these credibility kind of corresponds to the size it part of this presentation and the remaining ones <laughs> to the operationalize it part. Um, this, this uh, discussion of these elements will necessarily be high level. So if you have questions about what we're going over, which will be a little bit quick, don't hesitate to type them in the sidebar or follow up with us after the conversation or after the presentation. All right, so let's get into this. So the concept of credibility is an important one for insurance and also ACOs that are taking on claims risk. Essentially, the law of large numbers, with the law of large numbers, average member claim dollars will be more stable over time for larger patient panels. This is really significant for ACOs. If the entire premise of a value-based arrangement is to be measured on performance over time, you really do not want the noise of claims volatility to drown out the actual outcomes you're working so hard to generate. Um, this graphic on the screen shows the simulated variability in performance here over benchmark year expenditures by group size using Medicare fee-for-service population data. You know, as expected, smaller patient panels are significantly more volatile. So, however, size is really not the only consideration when you're thinking about how to correctly structure your ACO or other value-based arrangement. While larger ACOs do benefit from claim stability and also the ability to invest in technical resources, Smaller ACOs do have advantages. They have a greater ability to generate a shared sense of purpose and buy-in with their participating providers. So indeed, when you're taking a look at MSSP results over the duration of the program, we see significant variability in large ACO outcomes, um, really more than we would expect. We, this can arise as a result of a variety of reasons, but in large part, we think it's due to changes in the provider panel or the inability to implement a shared vision over time. These are less, you know, less of a concern for smaller ACOs. So there are some advantages there. So um, if you are a smaller ACO, and in this context, I mean probably an ACO with maybe 30,000 or fewer beneficiaries, there are real advantages. Um, and there are ways to deal with the claims volatility. 
So risk adjustment is the first tool that's used in almost all value-based arrangements to reduce volatility. This graphic on the slide shows how kind of a, just a simulated distribution can be um, tightened up if you add in a risk adjuster, which basically uh, kind of normalizes cost for, for patient morbidity. If you're in an arrangement with a commercial payer, ask them to use a concurrent commercially available model with a high predictive power, such as MAR or DXCG to help reduce volatility further. In addition to the items just discussed, um, this slide outlines additional steps that an ACO can take to limit claims volatility exposure. Carve-outs, loss limits, and models that are based on targets besides the total cost of care can be particularly helpful. And then finally, a detailed review of provider practice patterns and attributed members can help identify sources of unwanted volatility, allowing the ACO management to decide if or how to, um, how to take action about how to deal with those issues. All right, so taking a step back, we're now gonna shift over to another key element of value-based arrangements, attribution. In a value-based arrangement, providers take on financial responsibility for patients but which patients? This is the question that attribution is trying to answer and it defines this connection. There are three major approaches to attribution, claims-based, patient-selected, and geographic-based. The claims-based approach is very common and typically relies on attributing members based on where they sought the plurality of primary care services. While it's often convenient, it does require data processing and requires choosing um, between trade-offs of perspective and retrospective approaches, which we'll discuss more in a minute. Patient-selected attribution is a favorite of both patients and providers, but there are complexities with how to engage members, record who they select, and also dealing with members that don't select a PCP. Finally, um, geographic-based attribution is simple, but it only occasionally is used because it requires an extremely narrow network within a region to really make this level of assignment work. All right, now getting back to um, a concept associated with claims-based claims -based attribution, if you're engaged in value-based care, you'll probably be using claims-based assignment in which um, you'll have to consider retrospective or prospective attribution. In many cases, the payer will choose the approach for you, but in case you do have a choice, um, as is the case with MSSP, it's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. So retrospective attribution is based on claims that actually occur during the performance year. So while providers are then responsible for individuals that they actively inter interacted with during the year, that final list is not known until after the effect, which is a disadvantage. Prospective attribution, on the other hand, is based on claims from roughly the prior year or years. This allows providers to know ahead of time who they're going to be responsible for, roughly. Um, but there is a possibility that attributed individuals may not even interact with the ACO providers during the performance year. So there are a few more considerations listed on this slide. If you're interested in a more thorough comparison of these two approaches, feel free to reach out and we can connect you with resources. There's a few more attribution considerations that are important when um, developing an attribution methodology. As an ACO, it's important for you to ask for detail about how an attribution arrangement is going to be structured so that you can understand how it will impact your providers. And then if it's an option, go back to the payer to ask them to um, make possible adjustments to that approach that will make it better suited for the providers in your ACO and more likely that you're gonna be able to connect with the patients that you should be managing. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Brent. Thanks, Colleen. As, as she mentioned, I'm gonna be covering benchmark and financial reconciliation considerations. So first, let's start with benchmark considerations. So at a high level, what is, what is a benchmark? Well, it's the target cost, and often on a per-member basis, that an ACO or, an, or a provider has to aim for under a value-based contract. So if you think about it as actual expenditures come in during the performance year, um, if those actual expenditures are lower than the benchmark, then the result is shared savings. But if the result's higher than the benchmark, it could result in shared losses, depending on the value-based contract that's in place. And I'll get more into that in just a minute. Uh, but since shared savings and losses are calculated off the benchmark, this is one of the key considerations for an ACO or providers to understand, um, to know how it's calculated, and we'll talk about some key considerations when negotiating the benchmark. 
Uh, there's an approach for setting the benchmark that Medicare ACO programs often use, and then some other common approaches used by payers in other markets, such as commercial or, or the MA markets. And so let's, if we look at both of those, um, on this slide I've highlighted both. So you have the prior experience approach and a percent of revenue approach percent of revenue approach for setting the benchmark. So in either of these, in both of these cases, the, the benchmark is set on prior experience. On the left, the prior experience is typically how Medicare calculates the benchmark under ACO programs. And then on the right is what you see more often in, in commercial or MA uh, value-based contracts. So if we talk about the prior experience approach, really at, at a very simple level, past experience or expenditures are collected for the attributed members. They get risk adjusted based on the risk of the underlying population and trended forward to the benchmark period. Applying those factors gets you to this target cost under the value-based contract using this benchmarking approach. Now the percent of revenue uh, approach is, is simpler. You really, it's based on a premium that's set by a payer whether in the commercial or MA market. And then a negotiated loss ratio target um, is set. So you take the premium, apply the loss ratio target percentage to get to the benchmark. And, uh, and really, you can see here, because it is simple, and there's really only one factor involved in the, law, in the percent of revenue benchmark, um, making sure that, that it's an achievable loss ratio target is really important. And one thing I've also noticed as I've worked with clients on these types of arrangements is it's important to consider all the pieces of the contract too, not just the loss ratio target. So if you think about reimbursement levels or shared savings or potential earnups, quality measures, things like that, um, sometimes you might not be able to get the ideal you know, parameter for any one of those. But if you look at this in a package, you may be able to compensate for a harder to, to reach loss ratio target by higher reimbursement. So looking at it as, as an overall package and considering the financial incomes is really important as, as you think about benchmarking here. Now there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of these methods for calculating the benchmark. And broadly speaking, the, the prior experience benchmarks better reflect obviously the prior, prior experience of the ACO and the members that are gonna be um, cared for under the ACO or provider group. Uh, because it is based on the ACO's experience though, and I'll talk about this in just a sec too, but the, the rebasing, how frequently you rebase the benchmark um, may make it more difficult for the ACO to generate savings since the more frequent the re rebasing occurs, the more the ACO competes against their own improvement and performances. Uh, the percent of revenue benchmark is, a, as I mentioned, a much simpler approach, although there is quite a bit of trust that's required uh, between the provider and the payer who's really determining the premium and the pricing. So with each of these approaches, there are, approaches, there are some important questions that use providers I think should be asking. And for the prior experience benchmarks, you know, whether this is MSSP, direct contracting, next gen, or, or even some commercial arrangements, some of the questions are how do you handle outlier claims in the benchmark period? How frequently should the benchmark be rebased? Annually, every three years, or even less frequently? Uh, if you're an ACO who is already efficient, how can you negotiate this to be more appealing? And I say negotiate kind of loosely here. Um, negotiating with CMS isn't really an option, but as you, you may have that option if you're negotiating a value-based contract maybe with payers. How do you trend the benchmark from the past to present in a way that's reasonable and fair? Uh, how do you risk adjust the benchmark? And how are those risk scores normalized? Do you use one year, multiple years of data in the experience period? Um, sometimes using one year, the most recent year, can give a better perspective of what's, what the current trends are. But using multiple years can smooth some of the data noise. And then which members are included for developing the experience benchmark? So those were the, the prior experience benchmark questions. For percent of revenue benchmarks, the questions are, are similar, um, but there are some different ones. So, do you use the provider trust how the payer developed the, the, the premium used to develop the benchmark? Do you include individuals with outlier claims in the experience for setting the premium? Um, hey, how do you adjust the revenue? Is it based on rating, sell, risk adjustment, or some combination of the two? And really finally, and what I'd say is probably the most important question to ask under, under this percent of revenue benchmark approach is how do you make this transparent? 
often from a provider's perspective, I've seen that it feels like a black box of, you know, how did this premium get set? And now I'm held as a held responsible for managing costs and expenditures to that. And I've seen some effective ways to make it clear for the providers, but you know, making sure that you're, you're having open communication with payers and, and people, entities involved in contracting is going to be important. Um, I mean, obviously in both approaches, but particularly in the percent of revenue benchmark approach. So over the years working with providers and value-based contracts and asking those questions I just listed out, narrowed down the list of some key benchmarking considerations to these six bullets that I have on the slide. Each bullet uh, in some ways relate to the, the questions that I posed. And the good news is, is that all these benchmarking factors can be reviewed analytically. And, and also this is, what, this is what Colleen and I have, have done over the years. Um, sometimes the results of that an analysis will point to a clear, here's the right choice given your situation. Sometimes it doesn't, um, but almost always it'll provide a better understanding of the risks a provider will face when entering a value-based contract and provide some insights of how, how the benchmark um, in particular may affect some financial outcomes. So finally, I'm gonna wrap up and talk about financial reconciliation considerations. So after you've set the benchmark, your expenditures come in and are compared against the benchmark, if you actually generate some savings, the expenditures come in less than the benchmark, this is the big question of, okay, well, what does that mean? How much money are we actually gonna make as an ACO or a provider? And that's really what I'm talking about when I say financial reconciliation is how are those savings that were generated shared? And what are the requirements under the contract for the provider or the ACO to get those shared savings? Now, the big caveat here is every financial reconciliation contract is different. So there's no one catch-all approach for, for looking at these, but as we've looked through these, there is a common theme uh, of some key, key considerations. So I've got four of them listed here, MSR and MLR. That, that's the minimum savings rate or the minimum loss rate. And this is really a protection for, for particularly smaller ACOs of there's, there's a gap or, or a minimum savings or minimum loss that has to be exceeded before the savings actually um, or losses are shared. And this provides some protection of just data noise or fluctuation from one year to the next um, so that shared losses aren't shared up front. Um, risk sharing caps, these are often at the, the extreme. So you may have a, an arrangement where uh, ex, ex, large losses get capped at a certain percentage and that, that offers protection to providers and ACOs and that typically comes at a cost with that cost being that shared savings will also be capped uh, at a certain percentage. Next, you've got quality score. So how the quality score affects the, the financial reconciliation is important. Um, in ACO programs, you often see the quality, quality score is simply a, a percent adjustment or a scalar to the shared savings. So if you earned a quality score of you know, 90%, you'd get 90% of the shared savings that you generated. Um, other contracts may take may apply some sort of bonus on a PM, PM basis or a total dollar basis um, for meeting certain quality measures. So understanding how that gets applied and an important part too is what the quality metrics are. That as a provider in ACO, you understand those metrics and, and feel like they're reasonable and are ultimately gonna help improve the care of patients and manage the, the care of patients, the cost of that care for the patients. And then finally, and probably the simplest of all the four, is the shared savings percent. So if you generate a million dollars of shared savings, what percent of that are you actually going to keep? Um, this is gonna, this gonna be important to make sure that this is sufficient, creating sufficient incentives for providers. And you know, I, I will say that often shared savings and shared losses aren't mirrored. Um, there, there's op options to vary the, the percentages over time allow some sort of phase in and ramp up of managing care and costs. And so understanding what the options are and then how those options can be applied in your situation are, are important as we look at financial reconciliation. So what I've got here on this um, next slide is just kind of a, a 
recap of a few things to remember before I look at a couple examples. So as I've gotten that first bullet, we've got the four key considerations that I just talked through, but there are additional considerations too that have a significant impact on savings. And I won't go into a lot of detail on these um, because Colleen's already touched on some of them and just to manage our time here. Um, but as you're looking into your own program and thinking about the impact of these factors, it'll be important for you to make sure that you understand how each of them can affect the financial outcome of your value-based contract. So finally, I mentioned I'd share a few examples. And so this graph uh, shows the financial reconciliation outcomes for a few different CMMI programs. You can see along the bottom, we've got percentages ranging from minus 40% to 40%. And that is the total shared savings or losses. So the actual expenditures compared to the benchmark. And, and going up the side, you see the percentages ranging from minus 30% to 30%. And that is the final shared savings or losses after the financial reconciliations applied. So just glancing at this graph, you can really see how the shared savings and loss percentages vary between each of the programs and how the different parameters can really affect the outcomes, um, the opportunity on the upside and the, the risk of downside shared losses. Um, you can also see the, the loss limits as you get to the, the extremes where, for example, on the orange and the gray and the green lines um, on the shared savings, you can see that levels out. Those are the risk sharing caps. Uh, you can see the start of the risk, risk loss caps um, on the gray line and the orange line to the left. Um, and that's the, that's the protection of that key consideration of where those get applied in these programs. Now we think about quality scores and MSR and MLR. Those you can't see in comparing these, but the quality score is already baked in. As you can see in the bullets, we assumed 80%. If an ACO were to have you know, a perfect quality score of 100%, what you'd really see is the shared savings would increase from what I have shown here. Now quality scores under these programs don't affect the shared losses. They don't reduce the shared losses if you happen to have a, a quality score of less than 100%. So that's only an impact on the shared savings side. Um, and then the MSR, the minimum savings rate and the minimum loss rate, I didn't illustrate that here, um, only because really that varies from ACO to ACO. But had I illustrated that, what that would be is right at the intersection of the, the graph where all those lines come together, you'd see the shared savings just be 0% for a range of maybe plus or minus 2% or plus or minus 3%. And that's because, as I mentioned, um, it, it, it sets this threshold for ACOs where they have to achieve a certain level of savings or losses before those losses and savings are shared. So financial reconciliation is what drives these programs and really make sure the ACO, making sure the ACOs and providers understand and are comfortable with the risks associated with reconciliation is key. And so just to wrap things up, Colleen and I have spent a lot of time thinking about these different factors and you know, group size, attribution, benchmarking, financial reconciliation, probably more than we'd like to admit, but I'd just like to reiterate the importance of these, uh, these considerations and analyzing how each of them not only affects the opportunity, but more importantly, the risks you'll face as an ACO or provider and how those relate to your financial success. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today and I'll turn it back over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you, Dr. Davis. So we have just a few minutes, so maybe I thought what I would do is see if I can ask a question that might be interesting to our audience. So Dr. Davis, one for you is, if you could get a physician to agree to one thing that would make an ACO successful, what would be that on your wish list? Uh, to work on the, uh, getting their uh, inpatient days uh, down, their inpatient expenses down because that's the single greatest cost uh, associated with these contracts. It really doesn't matter what risk arrangement that you have. If you, uh, if you can decrease your inpatient days, if you decrease your in inpatient costs, you're, you're really going to have success because that really sticks out like a sore thumb. And there's all sorts of other things, but the, importance and the important part of succeeding about this is getting the, the physician engaged uh, to understand that it's to their benefit to do it, 
And then once they do that, then you start identifying the outlying uh, costs and the big one there is inpatient. Okay, thank you. So Brent or Colleen, either one can take this uh, question for you, but since there's only 53 ACO or DCEs, direct contracting entities, and they put a hold on those for going forward, there's still some confusion about the 3% cap on coding. So is there still a, a ability to increase your coding, HCC, hierarchical coding condition cap by 3% is part A. And part B, could you explain what the coding intensity factor is? I can take this one. So in short, there is an opportunity to increase your, your benchmark through coding improvement up to that 3% that Kelly mentioned. But it's important here to remember that there's a, a normalizing or intensity adjustment that you have to consider year after year. Essentially, the normalization adjustment is um, the average uh, risk score for the relevant population over the year. And typically, that has crept up over time. So it means that if you, you need to actually, even if you hit that 3%, still continue to work on risk coding improvement over time so that um, you, know, you can kind of stay ahead of this effect of risk score normalization and maximize the impact of risk adjustment on your benchmark. All right, well, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today and explaining a little bit more about value-based care. Really appreciate it. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Pinnacle and Milliman and uh, the Medicus firm. I uh, appreciate you joining us today. And if you heard anything that you like and you'd like to save the session, you can use your virtual tote bag. Enjoy the virtual conference. Thank you.